Good afternoon. I know people have a lot to do today. It's a busy, active day. Um, just hope, thank you for joining us for a brief moment to talk about Williams Athletics. Um, if your child might be thinking about trying out for being a part of a varsity team, we're hoping we can give you a little information about that process today. And um, I'm Lisa Melendy. I'm the Director of Athletics. Um, I know that dropping a student off at college is a momentous occasion, whether it's your first or last. I have dropped three off in the past six years, including my last child, who was a first year this year on another campus. Um, so I've, in the midst of doing all of this, uh, just like you are, uh, saying goodbye and moving in and, and all of that. So I can definitely relate to you. Um, okay, we really want to welcome you to Williams and to um, our athletic department. And just want to share again, like I said, a little bit about, about what we do. Um, we have 32 varsity teams at Williams. It's a very large program, about roughly 750 student athletes annually. Um, also, we uh, club and intramural sports are part of our department, as well as physical education. And there is a physical education requirement um, for graduation that all students need to fulfill, um, some of which can be fulfilled through varsity athletics. Are you talking about that? No, you don't need to. I just suddenly rose as I started. I might be stepping on your, on your lines. Um, and they, they'll hear more about that themselves in our opening night. Um, uh, with teams and coaches. We really focus um, our athletic endeavors, our varsity athletic endeavors, on the personal growth of our athletes, um, trying to help them develop as people beyond the sport, and, and really think about how are we defining success for them well beyond wins and losses. Um, all of our coaches, our um, head coaches, are faculty members, and really take their role in that seriously and think of their different venues as their classrooms, and are, again, are trying to stretch and challenge your children in the same way um, and, and bring expertise to the field. Another thing our coaches really focus on is in the same way that an academic professor might be a physics professor, getting your student really excited about being in a physics class, our coaches are really great at imparting the passion they have for the sport. That is their educational vehicle. And they really um, hope that their students leave with an excitement and enjoyment um, for that sport as a lifelong pursuit. We also talk a lot about how are we caring for each other, how are we taking care of each other as members of the team, what are our obligations to each other in creating our small community and then impacting the rest of the campus. And finally, one of the things that we really do a lot with our coaches um, are building teams. For many young athletes these days, they don't come from that same sort of high school team experience that um, folks might have in the past. For some, it might be their first time actually being on a team or being on a team that is not a travel club type of team. Um, and so they spend a lot of time on helping them understand their role as members of a team, what the, um, what, again, what their responsibilities are and also what support that team lends to them. And again, the, the purpose of the panel, as I said, is to sort of share a little bit today about how we can all support um, student athletes as they make this transition to college. Um, a couple of coaches and a member of our administrative team, um, Mark Mandel is our head men's crew coach, Kevin Knapp is our men's basketball coach, and Carolyn Miles is our deputy um, athletic director in charge of student services and, and does a lot of support services for our athletes. Um, but we want to share again, like I said, a little bit about what to expect now and, and beyond. Um, and I hope that we can talk to you about how you get to, can be a positive part of the team as well and provide some reassurance for you if you're nervous about anything as best we can. Um, a lot of it is, is how do we think about how we help them navigate this new landscape? How are we supporting them through this transition? That's a lot of what the coaches are doing, especially for the first years, right? Helping them adjust to, to being at college and to learn um, what it means to be a part of a college team. And you know, as again, I've already just alluded to the fact that I had three children who played on multiple youth sports teams, travel teams, high school teams, town teams, um, more numbers of teams than I can count. So again, I really appreciate what it took for you as a family to arrive at this moment. Um, to have a student who is potentially a college athlete means that you've invested a lot of time in travel and water bottles and uniforms and um, trying to eat in the car and, and get to the next event and, and weekends at tournaments and so on. So I understand that, it, that it's a lot. Um, and one thing that I've learned through that journey, my own journey, um, is how parents and coaches don't always see the game the same way. And I've shared this story every year. My now 24-year-old daughter, when she was 10, playing on a travel soccer team. I coached soccer, collegiate soccer, for 20 years. And um, for all that time, I'm watching the game like a coach. So I'm at her youth game. She's on the bench. And I'm watching, you know, the team loses the ball. How are they getting back in transition? How are they getting up on offense? Where are they positioning themselves? 
And then my daughter came into the game. Suddenly my daughter was the only person on the field. <laughs> and I am following her, and literally in that moment I said, oh, this is how a parent watches a game, which is remarkably different from how I was watching the game a few minutes before she came in. And so I know that, that we don't always have the same perspective on what's happening. Um, but I can assure you that our coaches are trying to develop um, their student athletes and they're trying to put the best uh, team out there on, on competition day and trying to do everything they can within the rules of the game and within caring for your, um, for your students to win games, right? And they're making decisions. And so although you might have a different opinion, I have so much respect and confidence in our coaches um, that they are, again, primarily caring for your student, but they're also, as you know, trying to, to win games there. So just, just share that with you. Um, uh, one of the things that, uh, to think about, too, as we're transitioning our students is most Williams students are massive overachievers. They have had a lot of success in the classroom. They've had a lot of success athletically if they're in a position to be on a Williams College varsity athletic team. And so for some of them, this arena in athletics might be the first place in college athletics where something starts to feel a little bit like failure to them. I'm not the star player. I'm not starting on the team. I don't play as much as I used to, or I'm you know, not in the, in the, in the top group in a, in a particular sport. Um, so we talk a lot about how do we help them deal with that, again, that transition that new way of thinking. And part of it is, as one of the slides alluded to, is redefining success for them. Um, for many of them, making a college team, very few um, high school students play college sports. Making a college team at a very strong athletic and academic institution is a huge milestone in and of itself. All the lessons they'll learn, the passion they'll learn for the sport, hopefully more that they learn about the sport, and the lifelong friends they make are ways that you know, we really think of, of a successful team. Um, and I want to share, too, that sometimes this transition to college can feel like a, a lot of weight, a lot of pressure on these young students. And we're trying to do as much as we can to alleviate that stress. And one of the things that we would encourage them to do is to focus as much as they can on the team. Right? They have the team and the team outcomes, successes and failures, and support from their team, and as little as possible on their own personal um, you know, minutes and time and stats. And we also ask the parents to think that too, or family members, that uh, the more you can just talk about the team and be positive about the team and less assessing their performance and thinking about their stats and minutes, that really decreases their stress and lets them just, again, be excited about being part of a team. Um, you know, we've really learned that if you can accept their role on the team, they're more apt to accept their role. They don't want to disappoint you. They know, what I referenced before, that you've put a lot of time and effort into um, supporting their um, athletic career up to this point, and, and they want you to feel good about it, right? They don't want to disappoint you. So, as I said, your being, being reassuring is really important. How many of you coached your children in some level of sports at some point? Yeah. It's fewer than there have been in the past, but a good number of you. And, uh, you know, I just say, too, this is the moment where you get to just celebrate and be excited. Like, you get to hand them off to these professional coaches and just be a fan and, and enjoy the game and enjoy their growth and experience. Um, so, again, now we're going to turn to the panel and let them speak a little bit more specifically about what they do in their programs and how they view this. Um, and then I have a few closing remarks, and we'll have plenty of time at the end if there are questions from you all. So, thank you. Here we go, Mark Mandel's gonna start here. All right, so my name is Mark Mandel. I'm the men's rowing coach here. I'm in my eighth year. Don't confuse me with the president of the college. Um, I was here about a year before, but definitely did a double take when I saw the press release, and our first names are quite similar, so. Um, and I, so as a rowing coach, my background is in endurance sports. I have a 13-year-old. And he also is more of an endurance sport athlete, definitely not a ball sport athlete, but my almost 10-year-old daughter, um, she's the real like coordinated one in the family and recently has gotten into soccer. And so I laughed with your story because she really at times has wanted to play goalie. And then so she's played goalie a few times and I find when she's in goal, I really want the other team to like get the ball and try to score. Um, so really conflicted. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I don't tell anyone that, but, um, but thankfully I think she's better on offense, so we'll keep our fingers, fingers crossed there. But 
Um, so what drew me to Williams initially is probably what drew your kids here, and that's just this sense of excellence, both academically, athletically, and I, as a coach, um, actually came from a high school, uh, as a high school coach. Um, I wanted to be surrounded by like the best coaches and the most driven student athletes. Um, but what I've learned in like these seven years is that this success that we all see, you know, you saw in the recruiting process, I saw as I was like, you know, applying for this, this job, is that is what lies beneath the surface. And um, what lies beneath the surface are thoughtful coaches, supportive administrators who prioritize student athlete well-being above all else. Um, rarely, if ever, is winning and losing discussed in meetings, in one-on-ones, um, it's really, it's all about the student athletes. And um, I know we have parents here from all different sports, probably not a ton of, of rowing parents, but I'm gonna use some, you know, my team as an, as an example. Um, so in rowing, we always ask the question, will it make the boat go faster? And what I appreciate most about Williams is that process of making the boat go faster isn't so much about the act of training for rowing. It's not about like what boats we're using, um, but it's, it's so much more. And so I just wanna like touch on a few things that like we stress on our team that I know is also mirrored um, on the football field, on the basketball court, in the swimming pool, and, and, and so on. And a lot of this um, Lisa has already touched on. Um, so first off is intentional relationship building. Um, a fast team is a happy team. Um, and it's built on a foundation of relationships, teammates that know and value each other, whether they're in the first boat, whether they're in the, the bottom boat. Um, and, you know, sports, without even trying, foster a sense of friendship. Um, but something that I think all coaches try to foster in our teams is this um, sense of awareness of, you know, uh, how do you connect with your teammates beyond them just being an, an athlete? And so it, for us, what does that look like? Maybe we take a, we take a 30 minute bus ride to, to our boathouse. And so who are they sitting next to on the bus? Is it always their best friend? Is it always like the person, the people they're rowing with? Or you know, are they aware enough like, hey, I'm gonna like sit next to this person today and get to know them. Um, what I hear a lot about, you know, in the dining hall after practice, the whole team eats together. And you know, 85% of the time they're talking about rowing. And every now and then it's nice to not talk about rowing. And so just trying to get them to be thoughtful um, about that. And so I think that's something that as coaches, as we try to build community, um, that's really important. And um, you know, Williams, the people are the best part about um, the college. And so encouraging your um, student athletes to, um, you know, certainly they're gonna make great friends within their teams, but there's a whole host of people outside of the athletics realm as well that um, I think can make a richer experience if they're you know, building those relationships also. Um, one thing that you know, I was keyed into um, pretty early on here is the importance of sleep and wellness. Um, each year, you know, I see athletes who thrive and never, almost never miss a practice. Um, they're not injured. Um, while um, on the other side, I see athletes who it seems like every couple weeks they're injured or sick. Um, and you know, you can, any student in college is going to get sick. Um, and you can easily get all the sleep in the world and still like break your leg or pull your hamstring. Um, but I, um, I found athletes who prioritize their, their sleep, their nutrition, um, definitely have a better foundation for consistent training. And then that consistent training is going to create um, a much greater depth of experience. And so, you know, one thing that, you know, rowing is a, is a training sport, it's a volume-based sport, um, but I found at Williams, like, there's so much that are asked of our athletes, you know, in the classroom as well, extracurricular as well. And so it might be as a coach, we're doing less, but the quality is higher and um, we're really emphasizing the importance of sleep and, and wellness. Um, and then sort of my last point that I try to stress with the team is appreciating the journey. Um, in rowing, the time spent training versus the time spent racing is comical. Um, we'll spend 
hundreds and hundreds of hours over nine months, building to five or six six-minute races at the end of the season. Um, and given that um, the racing is such a small percentage of what we do, it's really important that our athletes um, appreciate the process and stay in the moment. Um, that's easy to say when um, you're winning championships. Um, and so 22, 23, our team didn't lose a race. Um, we won the national championship twice, uh, dare I say easily. Um, and so yeah, like we can sort of like keep our heads up and say yeah, we're a real process oriented team. Um, last year, um, we learned a lot. Um, so uh, coming into the national championship, we had taken our lumps, um, Wesley, and we were rowing in Wesleyan's wake um, the whole season. Um, and, but that chase led to the most purposeful practices I've ever seen as a coach. Um, we were slowly um, bridging that gap and we were posting times in practice that you know, were faster than, than the year before. Um, and in the final um, of the national championship, both Williams and Wesleyan broke like the record um, for the course record for the national championship by a lot. Um, rivaling a lot of D1 um, programs. Um, and Williams came up two feet short. Um, but despite losing in that heartbreaking fashion, I, I think our athletes were more proud about that effort than um, I saw them after winning the national championship, which was often more of a relief than a celebration. Um, and so they had recognized their effort in that pursuit of just boat speed, of making the boat go faster, of you know, being a family um, brought the best out of them. And so I don't, you know, I don't have much advice, but just I want to just say to, to thank you in advance for sharing your student athletes with us. I think as a coach, we get to see these students develop from their first year um, to their last. We're the one adult on campus that sees them more than, than anyone else, and we get to see their growth. And, you know, tomorrow I get to log, log in online at 6 in the morning to watch a student who rode at Williams race in the Paralympics and like his development was just incredible and so it's a real privilege as a coach um, to be able to build those relationships with your your sons and daughters so just wanted to say thank you and um, super excited for the year. First time eyes. Uh, if you walked into our locker room last year, uh, you would have seen this poster board uh, with that phrase on it. Um, we settled on that motto, uh, and <clears throat> I spoke to the team about, uh, wow, I get emotional when I speak to people. Uh, that's my new thing, <laughs> all right? But um, I, but we have, I have three kids under the age eight, um, and you know, we talked about, um, you know, those first. And, you know, it's the beauty of being a parent. Um, you know, the first step, the first uh, slide, first ice cream. Remember that? Uh, remember the eyes of your kids the first time they had ice cream? All right, that was the image I was trying to convey to our team is that um, first. And we talked about it. There's this, this mix of um, uncertainty and excitement there is a joy and a complete lack of expectations about um, what should come from it. Um, there is a curiosity and growth that follows from it, all right? Feeling that today? Probably. Um, you know, your, your sons and daughters are definitely feeling that. Um, well, why did we settle on that motto? Um, we had a team that was uh, 21 and 3 um, the previous year, and you know, went to our second straight NCAA tournament. A uh, lot of success. Most uh, regular season wins uh, since I'd been the head coach. Um, you know, at the end of the season, uh, a lot of the feedback was uh, just unfulfilled um, unhappiness uh, for the most part. Um, why? Right? I mean, I tell people my job, our job as coaches here is to develop individuals and high-performing teams, and create lifelong memories and relationships. We did that. 
Um, but something, something was not right. Uh, so we spent a lot of time in the spring meeting, talking, reviewing, um, going back and forth, uh, reflecting on the season. And, you know, our, our group settled on two uh, key areas that were getting in our way. Um, you know, it was, it was our personal egos and our personal expectations. Our egos, all right? What was my ego telling me? We just won 21 games. We were one of the best offenses in the country. I'm clearly doing the right things. Um, you know, theirs were telling, you know, our returning starters' egos were telling them, I, I, I've figured it out. I don't have to work as hard. Um, look at me. Uh, other players' egos were telling them the style, the coaches, the referees, their teammates were, were the people holding them back. Um, you know, essentially our egos were telling us, it's not me, it's them. Whoever them is, uh, it is them. Um, you know, and instead of, you know, uh, we were blaming others instead of looking at how to grow, how to improve, and really just how to enjoy uh, this great experience. Um, you know, expectations. Uh, some players expected more, more than they had the year before, more points, more minutes, um, more role. All right? Some were expecting the season to be easier because we had success the year before. Well, heck, this year's just going to be easier. Um, some were expecting, you know, that – Without a doubt, we were going to go further than we went the year before. When we made it to the Sweet 16, all right, coach, let me know when we're in the Elite Eight or the Final Four. All right, that's where we expect to be. All right, forgetting that, it's a long, enjoyable journey uh, to get to that point. All right, coaches, we were expecting that results would validate decisions. Um, you know, just kind of the false expectations, uh, you know, we can make along the way. All right. Well, you know, I'm proud to say last year uh, – you know, we did not win as many games in the regular season. We made it further in the postseason. Um, we had a great time. Uh, you know, fans had a great time. Every game was close. Came down to the wire. Uh, I lost a lot of hair. But uh, most importantly, uh, everybody left, you know, with just that fulfilled feeling. All right? Um, and, you know, so maybe you got it already. But what does that have to do with you? First time eyes. Um, you know, it's what I said, what today's about, why being on these panels, uh, being around today is so, uh, you know, rejuvenating to start another year because you see those eyes around campus, uh, that excitement, um, that anticipation, that curiosity. Um, try and keep it. Try and keep it. Uh, over the next four years, your ego, and you're going to say no, it is going to tell you, all right, that something more needs to happen. Um, your son or daughter needs to play more, uh, to score more. Uh, their team would achieve more if something was different. Um, it might tell you that the team's awesome because your son or daughter's on it too. That, that is going to happen too. <laughs> All right, what would they be without him or her? Um, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, just try to ignore it. Um, you know, it, it will come. Uh, but don't let it make you lose focus uh, on what's really important. All right? That's the people. It's the community. Um, it's the growth. It's the beauty of the areas, the campuses you'll get to go to. Uh, it's the competition. Um, you know, enjoy it. And just don't let those moments um, make you lose sight of that. Uh, and have that unfulfilled experience instead of that fulfilling one uh, that ours had. Uh, you know, expectations. Right? When your son or daughter first started playing sports, what was your expectation? Uh, what are yours now? Um, take some time to think about it. I, honestly, I, I think it's one thing that I've, I've tried to give people advice is think about what those expectations are um, and, and calibrate them if, if it's not going to leave with that fulfilling uh, experience. Um, you know, because obviously if they're, if they're accolades, if they're national championships, if they're playing time, if they're results, you know, we are in your corner and we wish you the best of luck and we're going to work our butt off to make you – uh, feel satisfied for them, um, but they're not guaranteed. Uh, a lot can happen. This is a, a growth and a competitive atmosphere uh, with a lot of other people involved, um, and it could leave you missing out on, on the important stuff. Uh, if your expectations are, you know, a strong community, right? growing alongside like-minded people, uh, creation of lifelong relationships, uh, your child being developed, you know, as a whole person by coaches that really, really care about them. Um, you know, 
those growth moments of getting scored on time and time again, all right, uh, for your kid, all right, you, you are in for the best four-year experience, um, and I can kind of guarantee you that. Um, so that's my, that's my advice, all right? Set your expectations, um, you know, and then just have those moments of, of checking your ego. Uh, I was going to leave you with one story. Uh, my daughter, uh, oldest daughter, got two now, um, uh, started second grade yesterday. Uh, she came on her first bus trip uh, with the team last year by herself, first solo bus trip. Uh, we drive up to Middlebury on a Saturday, and, you know, she'll tell you uh, she had the time of her life. Uh, the film is hysterical to watch. She was sitting behind our bench, pink pants, Williams, purple jersey on. Uh, every single play, she is doing something different. Uh, one, she's clapping. Uh, one, she's dancing. One, she's stretching. One, she's playing with her stuffed animals. One, she has her back turned uh, to the court and she's eating a snack. Uh, one, she's up sitting with other Williams fans that are in attendance. Um, I can tell you, she had the time of her life. All right, and she will tell you now. Um, she's already told me she's coming on another one uh, from here on out. Uh, <laughs> But she would tell you the best part was high-fiving the guys, uh, the snack bar at Middlebury, and the movie we watched on the bus. All right? Well, and she's not wrong. All right? But, uh, you know, we, we win the basketball game. Um, and it's a great game, uh, a place I haven't won very often at. Uh, we're 5-0 and for the first time in the NESCAC since I've been the head coach, first time in a long time, uh, being 5-0. and so I pick her up and say, hey, we're going to the locker room to celebrate, uh, you know, with the boys, as she calls them. Um, you know, and they want to thank you for coming and cheering them on. So she's, all right, great. We're heading up to the locker room. All of a sudden, I get a tug. Daddy, daddy. Oh, what, what? Come on, let's go. She's like, wait, did the boys win? <laughs> oh, so fir first time eyes. First time eyes. All right. Um, try to keep them. All right, try to enjoy it. Uh, when you have those ego, those moments, they're going to happen. We all want what's best. We all want more. Um, you know, maybe you'll remember that phrase for you uh, to keep those first-time eyes. Um, you know, as Mark said, uh, you know, congratulations. Uh, you know, your, your young, uh, uh, you know, men and women that you've raised are going to have a great experience and leave here with unbelievable moments and relationships. Uh, enjoy them. We can't wait to be a part of them. Uh, can't wait to watch. Thanks. So my name is Carolyn Miles and um, I am the Deputy Athletic Director and do a lot of our student athlete services. Uh, and since we're all sharing a little bit about our, our stories, I too am a parent. I have two kids up at the high school right now. One just started up there as a seventh grader, the other one is a junior. And he is, will be playing his fifth different varsity sport this winter, has decided now to do travel volleyball because if uh, playing soccer in Boston wasn't enough for our family to do every weekend, he will now be playing a New York-based volleyball team this winter. Um, so I get, I, all of that is just to say, I get what you've done. It's a lot of investment uh, to get to this point with your children, to get them to play at this level of collegiate sports. I, I do what I do. I love it. I've been here for 13 years. I have coached. I coached for over a decade and a half. I was in the rowing world as well, like Mark, uh, was raised a swimmer, turned rower in college, and then was fortunate enough to coach for several years after that, and did a stint doing both coaching and admin, and then came to Williams just to be at this amazing place to work with folks like Lisa and Mark and Kevin uh, every day, and I really enjoy it. But one of the things that I gather is hard, and I will be in your shoes in a couple of years, dropping your sons and daughters off his college as, you know, how do we make sure that they're cared for? And I'm here to tell you that first and foremost, if they are on a varsity sports team, they have amazing coaches who really care for them and, and treat them in a way that is, that is unlike anything I've seen before. And I've worked closely with these two men sitting next to me um, in particular situations where they've had to manage some, some challenging situations with student athletes, supporting them after they've gotten injured. You know, it is a lot of fun. Uh, our teams do well, we win a lot, but sometimes do, things don't always go as planned and, and they really are cared for um, here at Williams. 
I think, you know, it's on my mind because I have a teenage boy in the house and my grocery bills are really high. Like, how do they eat, <laughs> right? So fueling is something, and we hear this from parents a lot. Uh, we have spent a lot of time trying to make sure they uh, are fueled well. This, if you've driven around Williamstown, there's not a whole lot as far as restaurants, grocery stores in the area. The dining hall this summer did some expanded hours, so if there are parents out there of student athletes who are playing something like hockey or lacrosse, where the men's and women's teams go back to back with one another and perhaps they're not done by the typical dinner hour, we have expanded some of these dining options for your student athletes so they can get fuel after practice. Also teams that travel from afar coming back um, from a road trip. Some of our teams don't practice right here on campus, so that's great um, that we're doing that. Last year, we opened something called the Pasture. We're really big into the cow puns, so get ready. Um, <laughs> The pasture is a fueling station that all varsity athletes are allowed to come to regardless of if they're in season or out of season. Actually, our out of season athletes use it more. They get four snacks a week. It is in the snack bar in Chandler Gymnasium. So we use that during the week. They can come and grab all of them at once or they can come um, all different days of the week. They, they'll usually do it. It's things like protein shakes and cliff bars and Every two weeks, I cut fresh fruit cups up, and they love Tewsbury. Um, so, but they all come, and it's a great way for me to interact with the student athletes and, and get to know them a little bit more. So that is new. Uh, we're really excited about it. As I told the fall stu student athletes last week at opening night, 100% of the funding that we have for this goes to the fuel, and all of our coaches and support staff volunteer their time to make this run. So we don't we don't spend any of our money on the workers. We actually uh, buy snacks for the kids because we think it's really important. Uh, I do a lot of the support resources or oversee them, so things like athletic trainers. All of your student athletes will have an athletic trainer assigned to their team. These are individuals in addition to the coach that know them very well. Some of them have sideline trainers and some of them have athletic trainers that they can go see during their office hours. So for example, an athletic trainer doesn't ride the launch with, with Mark uh, at rowing practice, but they have a trainer who's great and her hours are always um, accessible to the student athletes. This is just another touch point for them. They can go see them if there's an acute injury, but also to deal with something, you know, if they're trying to return to play or something like that. We developed probably over a decade ago a really close connection with our integrative well-being services. This is our mental health providers. We do sports psychology drop-in hours. A lot of our coaches will bring one of, we have three professionals who are therapists at the, at the um, IWS Center, but also all three of them played sports in college and have really keen interest in sports performance. A lot of the coaches will bring them in just to meet the team as one of the first meetings. This, we have drop-in hours, like I said, for student athletes to do one-on-ones. We have some team sessions that we offer. And they come and we'll talk to our captains, which I'll share in a little bit. We also have uh, folks that we work with very closely in accessible education. And this is, we use them mostly if there's a, an injury for example, and we might need um, some accommodations in the classroom. Perhaps they need some extra time because they're, you know, they've had surgery or they've been out for a little bit. So we work really closely with them. We can also help folks move their space if mobility becomes an issue. And so if you ever think, oh, I, I heard this lady talk at the beginning, my, my student just got injured, contact me. They will get all this information as well, but right now they're getting emails constantly. So just file this away. Um, and then this one sheet that comes out, what do I do if I get hurt, is actually very helpful because all of these resources are there. Their athletic trainers know, their coaches know, and they, they can contact me. I do a lot of leadership development on campus as well. So I work, I oversee the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. Each team has two representatives on this committee. It's a line between the student athletes directly to the administration. This is uh, at every NCAA institution, and we do a lot of different initiatives. A lot of your students will be involved in great community service here on campus. They're in the uh, elementary school. We work very closely with our D3 partner, Special Olympics, and recently started two programs for our Special Olympic athletes in basketball and swimming, so it's, it's really great to have them. They do a lot of fundraising for Special Olympics, and then just support one another with fun events, like super fan games, and come out and watch, um, you know, 
basketball or go to a rowing regatta. It's, it's great to see the student athletes supporting one another. Um, I do meet with every single team every year to talk about hazing prevention. It's really important to us to make sure that the students come in and know that they are part of the program right away, that the culture is an inclusive one on this team, um, and that they are not going to engage in any of those behaviors. Very important to us. I work uh, to offer a program during the winter study of their sophomore year called Emerging Leaders, and coaches nominate sophomores to be part of this program. It's really great. Uh, we meet twice a week for the four weeks of winter study and have different speakers come in, and, and they just really think about what it's like to be a developing leader in their program um, and on campus. And then finally, you know, regardless of if they have done any of this leadership development as a, as a younger student athlete on campus, all of our captains attend a three-day captain's training, which will start this Monday. Uh, we do three days with all captains because it's really important for them to understand the role that they play on the team. So your young men and women coming to campus will have these, in addition to these amazing coaches that work with them, these really great leaders who, who know the resources here on campus and can connect the first years should they need that help. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. That was great. You can see um, how well cared for your students are as these examples of, of members of our department that are just really share from the heart and care deeply about your students. I just want to share a couple of other things that are um, out there for you all and some support information. Um, occasionally emails go out to parents from other parents on teams or from team stores saying, hey, here's swag you can buy. Here you can go to this tailgate. Here you can be a part of this. I just want to make it clear that all of that is voluntary. There's no you know, fundraising expectation from you from the athletic department or from those other parents. Um, you can go to a tailgate and not bring anything. You don't need to be sending money. You don't have to buy stuff. Just want to make that clear up front. We really want everyone to feel comfortable um, here. Um, and that also, you know, the, as Carolyn said, we are feeding the students, you know, so it's not on you to feed the students or provide um, uh, things, other things for them. We also have a fund on campus um, for students with financial, who are on financial aid to help support equipment. So again, if you have a student on financial aid, they're going to get an email that says, hey, if, you, you know, if you're buying a tennis racket and you're an aided student, we have um, support to help offset some of those costs. So um, just be aware of that and make sure your student's aware of that. Uh, you talked about the past year, and I just want to say, again, it's our goal to um, build and maintain strong and inclusive teams and, and build a community and, and you're a part of that. And as you come to athletic events, we also remind you about good sportsmanship and cheering positively and, and um, being there again in a, in a positive, supportive manner. We have a, um, a NESCAC initiative around sportsmanship, which includes um, our students' conduct in the activities, but also um, hoping that our fans, whoever they are, will be uh, uh, supporting the officials and the coaches and the teams in a positive manner. Um, so we ask you to, to be a part of that. Um, and as I said, you know, our, our main goals are supporting this inclusive, uh, joyful, emotionally stable space for um, students. And we really are excited to have your student athletes be a part of it. And we wish you all well. Um, and hopefully we'll see you on sidelines or at events um, cheering on our EFs, both your teams and maybe some others. So again, enjoy the day. Um, let's have some time here for some questions, if you have any. Uh, thank you very much. That was really uh, uplifting all three of you uh, to hear about the community and we're excited about. My son's a tennis player and I'm uh, very excited also just to be part of a team for the first time, you know, since individual. Um, but my question is uh, really actually about the, the train when you're talking about the trainers that they're assigned, is that physio? Because uh, my question is really about recovery. Like, um, is there, you know, I know they get so invested in their actual sport, but to be doing those other types of things like um, yoga things or, you know, or other stuff that keeps them um, longevity-wise and recovery-wise. Yeah, so the question was about the trainers and are those physios. I know, like, they are called physios, perhaps in, in – um, in England, they're certified athletic trainers, and we do have different modalities that they can can use. So the student athletes will meet them. The athletic trainers will talk about what they have. But typical, um, you know, we have the Norma Tech boots. We have hot and cold baths. We they tennis in particular. I know sometimes the student athletes will go and take a yoga class. 
to do some of that work. Uh, but each student is an individual, so depending on their needs, they will they will figure out what the, they need for their rehab. And I'd also sorry, I would also say that we, you know we have a strength and conditioning um, program for it, right? So they're working with our athletic trainers and with our coaches all the time to talk about recovery. As Mark alluded to, sleep. You know, our coaches are also planning recovery into their um, practice plans and often in consultation with our strength and conditioning coaches who are experts at both preparing and you know recovery is a big part of that and, and with athletic trainers too if there's certain injuries or certain things. At the end of every season, for instance, many of our coaches will meet with the trainers in sport performance and be like, hey, we saw a lot of this injury this year. Okay, what, what could we do to prevent that, right? What do we need to do here? Um, so all of those conversations are always happening. Is that available? Like are the athletic trainers and the passion stuff available to athletes in off season as well? Okay. Yes. This is all year. Yes. If they have an injury or something, they should see an athletic trainer on both days. Absolutely. I, you know, that's a good point, and I think the coaches will explain it because the the way back to clearance is different if they don't see their athletic trainer first. So, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, I have a a friend at home who is a doctor, right? But once they see the doctor, the doctor needs to clear them to come back to, to play. So it, the, the athletic trainers, and they'll get to meet them, are really fantastic. They'll talk to them about all these protocols. The athletic trainers are assigned, you know, we have, we're very lucky that we have eight of them, but we have 32 teams, as Lisa said. And so they, you know, Kevin's athletic trainer will have another sport in the fall season. And so they're still available. They make an appointment and they can touch base with them. Well, again, I know you're anxious to get off and say uh, goodbye to students if you haven't yet, and we're really excited, I said, to meet you on the sideline. Hopefully we'll see you around town or, or at other off-campus events. Thank you for coming today.